Um, so hi, my name's Annie. Um, I'm co-founder and member of Dot Project, and I'm here with Nicola, a member of Dot Project today. Welcome to our charity guide for building digital perfection, or as we like to call it, digital resilience, um, building digital resilience. I'm going to give you a quick background to Dot Project, our mission and approach and, and the work that we've done with charities. Um, and then Nick is going to walk us through four top tips for small charities. So, so that will be the chunky part of the talk today. You can move on, please, uh, Nick. So at Dot Project, our vision is a social economy where organisations and teams thrive collectively. Our mission is to guide organisations to build digital resilience. The building digital resilience is about having the ability to take advantage of change, to have the agility and speed underpinned by the strong foundation of the right technologies and processes. So just a little bit about us. The DOT Project is a non-profit. We are collectively owned and operated by our members and our members bring skills across a breadth of generalist and specialist digital expertise. We support organisations to strengthen their technology foundations alongside building the confidence of their teams. So what we deeply believe in is that a resilient organisation is one that embodies a mindset of being digital. And that's teams with the confidence, the culture, the skills, the practices and the aptitude to work digitally, but supported by the right technology data and processes that meets the needs and goals of you as an organisation. We have technology mentors that bring experience and skills across a variety of digital and technology strategy and delivery, but then our team mentors are supporting teams to, bring, to build open and collaborative cultures, and they support teams in designing roles and structures needed in a digital organisation. So just a little bit about the problem that we've been observing and despite the positive pivots to digital over the last couple of years, we are observing particular overwhelm across the sector. What we know and hear most often as key challenges are how to navigate a constantly changing technology landscape. And that's not going to change anytime soon. How to make sense of and harness the potential of digital that aligns to your existing internal resources and your service user needs how to access and manage funding to develop skills and resources, and importantly, how to build a solid case for digital, how to justify digital investment to boards and funders is an ongoing challenge. How to manage change that's brought about through digital, new systems, tools, and ways of working, and how to deeply understand the impact of digital on community organ communities that you're working alongside. And a large percentage of digital change projects fail because of this very nature of not taking into account the skill, the capacity and most importantly the time and patience to embed new models and ways of working across the whole organisation. Our solution at DOT Project is built around digital transformation and change projects need to be success successful through two fundamental levers, technology and teams. What we do is mentor organisations to look at the change they want to see through these two lenses. A technology lens that first takes stock of your existing infrastructure. What are the systems, the tools, the processes, the data that underpin your services and the ways in which you work? And then a team lens alongside that, that allows focus on evolving strategy and culture in a context of being digital. Our holistic approach supports like consultative assessments and advice, coaching, as well as leadership mentoring and strategic consultancy. But our approach is designed to be iterative and sustainable and work alongside your existing foundations and the skills and capabilities you have across your teams. Digital requires people and teams to work differently and we support organisations to adopt this change for the longer term. Creating positive spaces to build new relationships is one of our specialisms and what we love to do. And throughout our work together, we bring connections, networks and communities that can support organisations. So just to put it in practical terms, our key areas of focus are to support organisations to firstly assess and discover their strengths, resources and needs. 
What do you need to further enable you to achieve your goals, your decisions and your impact? Enable the teams to be digital, embodying the mindset that there is more to digital than technology. It embraces the human and the relational aspects of organisations, teams, processes and structures. And we champion technology reuse. We explore what you already have and how you can make best use of existing tools and equipment. We believe deeply in reuse and repurposing where possible. And we support you with practical approaches to good governance to ensure that the right systems and structures will deliver their best. And as I mentioned, we rarely deliver in isolation of others. And we pride ourselves in bringing together the right skills at the right time. So the result of working with us and working with social impact organisations is gaining confidence in being digital, operating and delivering more effectively with and alongside technology, to embrace technology to deliver a greater impact and ultimately to become more sustainable and thrive. We've worked with over 800 organisations to support them around building this confidence around being digital. We've supported funders to consider the impact of digital funding and to design new approaches to most effectively support grantees. And coaching and mentoring, mentoring is an integral part of everything we do. We use our technology and teams approach to guide organisations to how to successfully use both within their digital change projects and ultimately enable them to deliver their social impact. I'm going to hand over to Nick now, who's going to talk through some four top tips that we picked out for you today um, for small charities particularly. I'm going to hand over to you, Nick. Thanks, Sunny. Um, there are many things we could run through today, but we've picked um, our top four um, that we think will be most beneficial, certainly for um, in small um, charities. So they are running an audit, um, establishing good rhythms, writing briefs and working with digital partners. So if we talk about the audit first, um, we advise everyone to start with a tools audit. Um, what it allows you to do is really take stock of what you've currently got um, and starts um, helping to build ownership of, of what you already have. What we see time and time again when we work with small charities is that as you grow organically and your services grow organically, your tooling also grows organically. Um, and what that often leads to is a bit of a hodgepodge of tooling um, and a bit of a mix and match. Um, and we see quite a lot of duplication in tooling as well. And so the purpose of the audit is to help you better identify a few things. Um, so first of all, like how can you sweat your assets, as we say, which basically means make the most of what you've already got. How do you take what you have and make it work harder for you? Um, how do you rationalise what you have? Um, and this might be cutting down where you're using two tools to do a really similar job and you could be using one. Um, identify and create ownership. So make sure that every tool has a proper owner who's responsible for it and takes care of it. Um, and then it will help you to um, understand your true digital costs. Um, often costs are spread out in lots of different places. Um, and we see a lot that organisations don't actually have that really clear picture of exactly what they're paying for and when they're paying for it. In purely practical terms, what it is, is a, um, a, a big spreadsheet, really. Um, you can do it in lots of ways, but we find the simplest way is to just do it in a spreadsheet and it will let you list out all the tools and applications that you consume. So that would be everything from your back office systems like HR and finance and um, whether or not you're using something like Google or Microsoft Office um, to your CRM or even right through to image editing software. So everything that you might use across the organisation, um, any other technology that you rely on, such as servers, PCs, networks, um, software that you've installed onto machines, any cloud servers that are out there in existence. And then really importantly, um, suppliers, partners, staff and volunteers that are involved in supporting what you already have, um, able to start to look at what they do for you, what value they bring. So you might have a partner who looks after your website um, and a volunteer looking after social media or another volunteer looking after your mailing list. It's really good to get a full picture of all of that so you can really see um, what's working and what's not. 
What it should do is give you enough information to really give you a clear picture of your direct costs. So what are you paying for in terms of support um, to partners? What are your licensing costs? What's the licensing model that you have? Is it per, per user? Um, is it per set of features? Um, your people costs, so who, who are you paying to partners, to freelancers and any other hidden costs that you weren't aware of. Um, so sometimes um, people are paying for other sort of freelance services that you weren't aware of, like uh, creating an image or something like that. Um, it'll give you a view on the duplication. We see a lot um, that people will have a, a combination of both G Drive, OneDrive, Dropbox, um, some other file server network um, protocol. So they'll have lots of different uh, file sharing systems, um, which means that what we hear a lot is I can never find the document that I'm after. It also might give you an indication into any gaps that you've got. So where you actually aren't filling out rows because you don't have any software to support you in that in that role. Um, give you an idea of indirect costs um, and anything that you're currently working around. So you might have lots of spreadsheets that are out there and flying around. Just going to show you, you probably can't see this too clearly, and we are going to share a copy of this afterwards. So this, this audit that we're talking about here, we do have a template um, that we use when we start working with organisations um, and we're happy to share that with everybody today. Um, but really this spreadsheet, it just sort of walks you through the sort of things that we'd be looking at. So um, everything from your meeting software to your website, to your CRM, to fundraising, who's using it, what the costing is. And then it also lets you list out all of the, the partners um, and other people that are involved in, in looking after that and then how do we go about it <laughs> who and um, what do we do to gather this information because it's, it's all very well me saying oh we just do an audit but how do you actually practically go about it um, so the first thing is ask your finance team so they often have a really good picture of everything that you're paying for, everything that you have a license for, anything you have a subscription for. Um, if you don't have a finance team, whoever looks after paying your invoices or um, dealing with anything that comes in through the bank account, I appreciate you might not have a, a dedicated team looking after that. Um, but they should be able to sort of go back 12 months and tell you anything that's been paid for in software terms. Poll your staff um, and when we say poll your staff, we mean um, your actual staff and any volunteers um, who work for you. Um, quite often what we see um, when you go out to um, the staff and volunteers is that you'll find shadow IT and I'm going to tell you what that is in just a, in just a second. And the practicalities of doing it would be um, using any of the sort of free survey tools that you can get out there. So Google, or Microsoft Forms, um, pretty much all of them have a free offering that would be suitable for this. Um, it's easy for people to access, fill it out, and they can normally, you can connect it up to Excel, which will just allow you to sort of filter and, and condense the information quite quickly afterwards. So shadow IT, what do I mean by shadow IT? Um, so this is quite often stuff that is happening in the background that's evolved because there wasn't an IT solution at the time. Either that there wasn't one that did what you needed or there wasn't the capacity um, to be able to build something at the time. Um, so, for example, you might have um, a newsletter that's being distributed that's being managed by a whole bunch of spreadsheets rather than being put into, say, MailChimp or some other um, newsletter like um, email marketing software. So it's important to start to gather that information so that you can be really clear on any risks that are associated with that. So what happens if that volunteer leaves? Where is that spreadsheet? Is there any privacy concerns relating to it? Um, so that's what we mean by that. What you're trying to get to is to really know the true cost um, of of all of that um, tooling. So um, direct costs, which of uh, finance or, or whoever looks after your money will be able to give you the indirect costs. So any of this um, sort of stuff that's happening in the background that you weren't even aware of um, and anything also that you didn't even know was costing you money. So quite often um, people have spun up 
um, little uh, smaller trials of things and then they're on a really small license fee and we see um, sometimes that those are just being paid out of other people's bank accounts and it's not even being included inside of the, uh, the charity space. So if those people go away or uh, disappear, you lose access to the tooling and then um, you also is not being paid for anymore. So that's the audit side of things. Like I say, I'll send out a copy of the, the template afterwards. Establishing rhythms, what do we mean by this? We really mean starting to create some spaces to talk about it. So we see time and time again that people don't make spaces in the uh, diary to talk about technology. Um, it gets deprioritized um, in favor of other things. Um, quite often the priority would be, well, why would I be talking about that? I need to be talking about service delivery to the service users. I need to be talking about our impact. And all of those things are so true. You do need to be talking about all of those, but the tooling and the technology powers you to deliver all of those things. So when you don't make space to talk about it, we see that things start to fall down um, because people aren't sharing any experiences or challenges or solutions. Um, we start seeing people working around the systems and we just see um, it just starts to break down a little bit. What you need from your systems and your um, tooling changes over time. Um, there's a real uh, tendency to put a solution in and go, well, we've got a solution for that. It's done, right? We don't need to do anything else. Um, but that's not really how technology works. It has to power you to, to drive your services and processes. So if you start to change a service, it evolves because the nature of what you do is evolving. Um, or you get a new partnership in turn, um, or there might be some legislation that changes how you have to work, um, then you need to adapt your systems to support that change in process. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to make time and space to talk about it as an actual thing, an actual um, discussion point, rather than just something that isn't really spoken about. In those conversations is when you really start to see um, frustrations, restrictions, opportunities of how things can be done better. When we debrief with our charities after we've worked with them, we always hit pretty much every single time we'll hear how valuable it's been to just have the space to talk about it um, and how much they've learned in those spaces. And actually, I've been in those sessions where solutions have been found in session just by someone saying it really bugs me that I can't do this thing. And then someone's already saying I know how to fix that. I already have the solution. So it's super important and it just shouldn't be undervalued. How do you do it is the question. So we've seen organisations do it in lots of different ways. So it might be that you want to just add um, 15 minutes or so into a regular meeting slot that you have that has a technology focus. Um, even put a subject to it, um, it's up to you, but tack some time onto a meeting um, specifically to talk about technology. Some people might run a monthly or a bi-weekly um, sort of tech surgery, if you like, or tech meeting, call it whatever um, works for your organisation, which is just a bit of a free format session to come in and share frustrations, wins, learnings. Um, you might even give it a topic again. You might say this week we're going to talk about the CRM. Next week we're going to talk about um, Google and Microsoft but just having a focus and a space that people can come to. If you do have people in your organisation that um, actually are uh, real sort of champions of a particular system, so let's say you've got someone who is, is really strong on using a particular piece of software or really strong on your case management system or your CRM, then give them the opportunity maybe to run drop-in clinics. So they might run something every again every other week where they just open up a space that anybody can drop into um, just to ask any question or to see if there's an opportunity to do something different. Um, whichever way you choose to approach it to get some rhythm and conversation going, make sure that someone owns that session. So somebody's responsible for making sure it happens. Someone's responsible for making sure that anything that comes out of that session is followed up on um, and dealt with. Otherwise, um, there's just a tendency for it to be a bit of a conversation that doesn't go anywhere. So um, make sure that there is ownership associated with it as well. 
Moving on to number three, um, the the key to getting um, a good technology solution is being really clear on what you want. So we often see organisations that don't have the right tooling in place and often the root cause for that is that the solution they selected was selected without a proper brief. It doesn't help you um, as an organisation, it doesn't help the people you're applying, um, approaching for a quote if it's not really clear. Um, getting that alignment internally um, and giving you real clarity on what you're trying to solve will just reap dividends in the in the long run. And we see people then approach with a really loose brief. And what happens is it creates a real challenge and um, misalignment between you and the partner. So the partner thinks they're delivering you one thing, um, but what they deliver you isn't what you were expecting. It doesn't match your expectations and it kind of just sets everybody off on the on the wrong foot, um, which will dovetail into point number four, which is working with partners. Um, so it's really important to get the brief right. Um, a real world example of this is um, we worked with a charity through a funded programme through Comet Relief and we talked them through how to create briefs. It was one of their challenges was they needed a piece of work doing and they wanted to go out to partners to select um, a partner to, to deliver that piece of work. And we provided them with a brief template, which again, I'm happy to uh, provide after um, this session. And we worked with them to create that brief to send out to partners. What they, the reflection they had after doing that was almost a bit of a light bulb moment. And they realized that up until now, they had repeatedly been going out to people kind of with a general ask, quite often to their network or um, network of network where people have recommended going out quite a vague um, ask of what they needed and they just never quite getting the end result they wanted. They realised that by running the brief and forcing themselves to have a real conversation about what they wanted to achieve, really focused it and made sure they were going out with the right questions so much so that they've now adopted it for everything they go out for. So even when they've approached someone for training, they've gone through the same process. It just got them into the, the, the mindset of being really clear on what they need up front. So what do you need in a brief? Um, tell them about yourselves and your audiences. It really helps as a partner when you're trying to uh, respond to a brief to get, if you know a bit more um, about the charity that's asking for the help. Um, it just helps you understand what might be an appropriate solution if you know a bit more about charity. Be really clear on what you need, not just um, the outputs, like the, the real practical things, but also the outcomes, like what are you going to measure? What's what's going to be success for this to know that you've got it right? Um, create some clarity on budgets and timeline. Um, it, it's really difficult um, if you don't give a partner a budget for them to really know how to respond to that because there's normally lots of different ways to solve a problem and so by providing a budget it allows them to make sure they provide a solution back to you um, that is going to be most appropriate for what you need. Make sure you talk about any challenges um, that you might have. So, for example, um, if you are running all of part time staff and or you don't work on Fridays or that you um, need to get access to certain people who need a six week lead time because they are volunteers, whatever it might be, make sure you're really clear. Um, anything that you have um, any specific technical requirements. So if, for example, um, you are 100% um, committed to Microsoft technologies and you don't want to consider anything else, make sure they know that. Um, any sign off or procurement processes that are um, important to you or any assessment criteria that's important to you when they respond to you. Um, and also, what do you want to know from them? So by that, we mean be really clear what you're expecting, what you're expecting back in response from the partner. Um, do you want them to break it down in a certain way? Um, if they're providing costs, do you want that broken down? Do you want to talk about support after the initial initial project? Um, ask them about their experiences, get them to provide any case studies. So just make sure when you're asking them to respond, you do ask for that extra bit of information about them as well. So. In terms of um, how do you um, approach different partners, um, 
We would always advocate calling and having a chat before you send any briefs out. Um, this just makes sure that you get um, sort of a interest of intent that they, they are interested in your project. Um, and also you can have a little chat about capacity at that point, make sure that what capacity they have is going to align with uh, what you need. Um, if you are going to be sending out a brief that contains anything that's particularly sensitive, you might want to get them to sign a confidentiality agreement before you send the brief out to them. Um, it gives you a chance to talk about timelines of when you want um, a response to it and also talk about how um, people can ask questions. So when you send out the brief, make sure um, that you give them a, a Forum some way to ask questions back to you. It might just be an email address, but they need they will need something um, because otherwise, how can they get that extra bit of clarity that they might need? Um, and just make sure that everybody is super interested in the project before you send it out. You don't want to send it out to lots of partners only to get like nobody respond to it. So we're going to talk about um, once you've got a partner and you're working with a digital partner, what does that really mean? Um, quite often people will um, maybe get a partner at the outset, but then think they don't need them afterwards. And sometimes that's true, but for a lot of the time it's not. Um, partners bring to your organisation um, skills and expertise that you may not have or you might not have the capacity to, to provide. Um, you might be able to do it, but you just can't have the bandwidth in your day to be able to do it. So they are there to really support you um, and make sure that that side of things doesn't need to be worried about. We do often see, as we talked about earlier, with um, where your services and things change, where you need to adapt your tooling, where you don't have a digital partner in place that continues to work with you after the original project, that that's where it falls down because nobody is continuing to look after that um, piece of software. So it doesn't get adapted, it doesn't get looked after, it doesn't get moved on um, with you. And that's when we hear we've got the wrong tool. Um, but often what they're actually saying is, um, the tool's not been looked after. So how do you work with your partners? Well, really, they're no different to any other partner. Um, I think people often think they are, um, but they're not. You still need to have a relationship and own it. Um, you still need to nurture that. You still need to keep the lines of communication open. So create a really clear picture of who your partners are and what their responsibilities are. And make sure you find the contracts. So we do often see people go, we have a partnership with person A. Um, but there's no contract in place um, or if there is a contract, nobody actually knows where it is. So go back and revisit them and make sure that that, that you've got everything that you need. Um, create some clear understanding internally of roles and responsibilities of who's going to manage the partners. Um, like I said, it's just like any other partnership. So someone's got to own it and look after it and, and keep talking to them. Um, get some routine practices in place so that you can effectively um, manage them. So don't just approach them ad hoc in an emergency. Um, make sure that you actually have regular rhythms, just as we were talking internally, get some regular rhythms externally as well. And acknowledge that it's a process that um, you have to own and evolve. Um, so no one gets everything right first time. So there might be some stumbling blocks along the way where things don't quite go as you expected to, them to. But the important thing is to work together to try and solve it. When you don't have those lines of communication and you just uh, kind of shut down because something might have been too difficult and don't try to actually assess what went wrong and how to fix it, um, can lead to this breakdown of relationship with partners. Um, and it's pretty hard to solve if that goes too far. Um, it's pretty hard to bring it back. So it's much easier to address it as the problems arise rather than um, further down the line. So how do we do that? Like I say, it's no different um, to any other relationship. It's got to be nurtured. Um, be really honest about if there's room for improvement. So that's on both sides. So and we often say, um, be aware of how responsive you are and how responsive they are. So quite often you see in partnerships that um, a partner is asking for information, but the charity has totally snowed under with um, other work and isn't able to respond. 
then does respond a lot later, um, but wants a, a great emergency on the response. So those kind of conversations are quite difficult because nobody really knows when the response is coming in. So they need to be responsive. You need to be responsive. Um, as we said, keep the lines of comms like really open um, and get some regular space in. So where we work with clients um, on projects, we um, put weekly check ins with our clients to make sure that uh, we're talking every week. And even if there's nothing to discuss, we check in and say, actually, we're all good. There's nothing to cover here today. And then we just carry on. But by having that regular cadence in forces you to have the space to talk to each other. Um, and just res um, respect some of the working patterns and um, practices. So if your partner does have a particular process of how to deal with them, like raising support requests, for example, um, then work with them to make sure you understand it. If it doesn't work for you, like really doesn't work with you, then have a conversation about how you can do things slightly differently, but don't work entirely around the process because it, it, it things will fall through the gaps if you don't follow the process that the partner has. So as we said, a successful partnership is really about um, working together um, and learning and growing um, as you go through the process to get the best end result. Um, they are there and good partners are there and really do want to work with you um, to make things better and they will be proactive and work hard for you when that relationship's working well. So um, I think the top tip is just really nurture it um, and make sure that it's, it's working for you. <laughs>